Welcome everybody to day two of AWS reInvent. Thank you so much for spending time with us today. We are at the Creating a Tech Revolution at the PGA Tour session and super excited to spend some time discussing the overall strategy and what PGA Tour is doing around tech reinvention, some of the research that Accenture has come up with that backs up the need for this new digital core, and then ultimately have a fireside chat with my good friend Ken here. Um, so maybe Ken, if you don't mind, just introductions, some headlines on yourself, and uh, some facts and figures would be great. Uh, yeah, so my name is Ken Lovell, I, um, and you can all read, so that's, um, that's my title. I'm responsible for golf technology at the PGA Tour, which is a very uh, random title. I think it's probably, uh, th there's not a big career path for golf technologists, uh, you know, not with that <laughs> specific name anyway. Uh, but basically, I'm responsible for collecting all the data that's possible to get off the golf course during a professional golf event in the United States, uh, and in other countries as well, now that I think about it. So essentially, anything that it takes for us to know what's going on and to plot the ball in three dimensions so anyone can understand what's happening at any time. And we'll go into a little bit more about what that means, but that, that's the big picture. It's a good picture. Uh, myself, Jefferson Wang, I'm a senior managing director at a company called Accenture. Uh, we are partners with the PGA Tour on this particular project that we'll talk to you about today. And we're a technology professional services company that works on full life cycle projects where we go from strategy to design to build to test and operate. Um, so today what we wanted to share with everybody is all the cool stuff PGA Tour is doing. And I'm not sure people really see all the amazing technology, all the convergence that's happened, all the innovation that the PGA Tour has gone through. Um, so maybe what we could start with, Ken, is if we really look at Ultimately, you said pull data off of the course. How? Yeah, so um, basically this is, the, I'm, I'm gonna talk for a second about the way that we have done it for the past 20 plus years. Uh, and then as we get through the discussion, we'll talk a little bit more about what's coming. So there's a, there's a tease for staying for the second half of the conversation. Um, but the way that we have done this, we, we, we built something in uh, about 20, a little over 20 years ago called ShotLink. And ShotLink was the beginning of going from just understanding what the score is, which, I mean, the score is a story, but also going further than that and understanding how the ball got where it got, what happened with it. The way that we used to do that, or did, uh, up until very recently, is um, I'll just kind of run you through a little bit of a timeline on it. Um, we would show up at a golf course about 10 days before the end of the tournament. Uh, we'd bring five trucks. We would start by dropping about 15 to 25 miles of cable on the ground. Uh, and that was a composite fiber and uh, power solution, so it had copper and fiber in the same cable. So the reason I bring that up is because it was really, really heavy, uh, and we would bury that. We ran it in, in six three-hole loops all the way around every uh, around the golf course, and the reason we did that is for redundancy and allow us to, so that we wouldn't have, if anything, if any fiber got cut anywhere, we could just loop it back and we would be okay. And by the way, fiber does get cut and it happens a lot. Uh, when you but can play also, this side. isn't regular fiber, right? I mean, this yeah. is like thick fiber. Yeah. This is, it's basically, it's instead of standard tack fiber, which is sort of the, you know, circumference ballpoint pen, this is about your thumb. It's, it's very heavy, uh, and it takes a lot of it to get around that far. So we, we'd start by putting that on the ground, uh, running it through the entire golf course, and then from there we'd start putting out uh, what we call D-marks. This were custom-designed cases that had in them network switches and a whisper generator um, and then and a propane solution that went along with that. Um, we would put one of those at every tee and one at every green and on a long par five, there would be one or sometimes two in the fairway depending on the length. That's the power and the network solution to get it all down. Then from there we would put up a wireless network um, and run the wireless throughout the entire golf course. This is across every fairway on, on the entire course and it's the very best Wi-Fi that you will never ever be, never, ever be able to touch. Um, we, we like you but you can't see it because that's where we collect all our data so we, we protect that a little bit. Um, and also not to interfere with the purposes of why you're actually pulling the data off. Exactly. Uh, and then once we would put that down on the ground, we would start adding sensors. So the sensors that we used to use included, uh, there was a handheld, there, was, there were tablets that were in the fairway, and another one around the green, a laser that was in the fairway. On top of that, we had one uh, radar that was sitting behind the tee box, and then we had an array of three cameras uh, that were set around every green. Those three cameras were, this is the very best technology of seven years ago, which I know doesn't sound like very long. Uh, it was actually still very good. Um, these were 20 frame per second, black and white, high definition cameras designed uh, for high contrast to pull a golf ball out of a dark surface or light one, depending on how where the sun was. Uh, and we would, we would basically spend, it took us from uh, Wednesday of advanced week through Tuesday to set all that up and, and get it ready to go. So how many, how many golfers do we have in the room? 
holy cow. <laughs> a lot of golfers. Was that somebody's like, yeah. pop, pop, you know, we can consider you a golfer. Um, how many people, when they watch, like to see kind of the path of the ball, speed, data, spin, launch angle? The exact same amount of people, surprisingly. <laughs> that is really hard to do. Honestly, it's really hard to do. Um, and the amount of time that it takes to pull data off of the golf course to a cloud and where it goes. Ken, can you tell us a little bit about what are the reasons why you would pull data off? What are some of the actual use cases on pulling data? Yeah, so actually one thing I just want to clarify pretty quickly, and especially given where we are, this is of interest. Um, one of the things that happened, I mentioned there were five trucks. We also put out, um, we put video boards all over the golf course. So anytime you see those cool boards that show you what's going on, that was our responsibility to put those out. We had to put power for those, network those, and make sure that they get data. Those are all automated and have unique data coming to them. And then on top of that, the other thing I was gonna mention is that we would have two uh, trucks that became a production studio to trap errors as they came off the golf course and make sure they were corrected as quickly as possible. In those was a giant set of servers uh, that was collecting all that video data. And then we would take that and run it off the golf course from there. So that is uh, something, that's, that's the way we used to do it. Um, why we do that, which I think was your question. So essentially this feeds everything. It is foundational to everything that happens at a golf tournament. If you don't have data, you don't have a story to tell. So what we realized is that you can point a camera at something, but unless you know why a guy is taking a shot, it doesn't really mean much. And we built a set of tools uh, that, well, essentially we built a distribution infrastructure. So you take all that information, you put it into a, a set of distribution infrastructure that's used for both broadcast, for digital, for, um, I, for our gambling partners, it turns out people like that, um, to, to, to do that with sports and stuff. So we, we serve all those different constituents and we do it with different, different tools that are built custom for each of them. So let me give you a quick example of why that's important. When you watch a golf tournament, and um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna, a little bit of a spoiler alert here, not every shot is live um, because at any given second, once we start playing golf on Thursday morning, there are an average of 14 balls in the air. All of them are moving. The question is, which one do you watch and which one are you looking at at a given moment? So a lot of things happen on tape as you tell the story of what's happening in the event. And you gotta think about this, and, and I'm, I'm gonna say this with no disrespect whatsoever for our friends in other sports, and I mean that. It is, very, disrespect. <laughs> well, it is very difficult to put a good sports broadcast together. Yeah. But if you have a single field and you have one ball and you take one camera and point it at the ball, you will know who won the game at the end of the game, right? This is a case where you're dealing with 200 acres and 18 playing fields, and all of them are happening simultaneously, but at different rates. So it is very much a, uh, a parallel processed sport, I guess, so to speak, right? Um, so you gotta figure out how to do that. When you watch on television, a lot of those shots are on tape. That means that when you see the score at the bottom, um, it has to be accurate to what's on the screen, but we're also collecting data in the second that it happens wherever it's happening. So we had to build some tools that would take that data and line those two things up so that it's time shifted appropriately and, and get things in the right place. So we built something called the Broadcast Interface Tool, and because we're really good at naming things, we called it the Brint. Uh, and, and that's what we would use, and we ran a line directly from our trucks into the broadcast so that we would be able to put that in and have it with as little latency as possible. And then we put someone in that truck and called them a, broad, or a graphics coordinator and wired that directly into the Chiron machine so that we would have that and, and make those graphics as, available, as high availability as possible. And in all honesty, a lot of the graphics, I'd say probably between, around 70% of those you never see because in the moment it just doesn't make sense. So we're producing as many interesting stories as we can that you might not have a chance to look at. It's not because we don't like you, we're just moving very quickly through a live sporting event. So when you think about just the sheer scale of this, by the way, probably in the middle and the end, we'll give you a chance please to ask questions. We'd love to kind of start to think about what questions you'd like to ask Ken um, around the topic because you're getting kind of the backstage view of all the actual hard work, the tech innovation, the convergence that happens to put on a story of golf. Um, when you look at that, Ken, you, you talked about a couple things. One is broadcast, media, sports betting. Mm -hmm. So you talked about sports betting. Is this something that is gaining popularity or has this always been there and it's just had a heavy requirement on you and golf tech? <laughs> Yeah, so there was a court case you may have heard about uh, not all that long ago. Uh, so sports betting is gaining a lot of traction in the United States. It is a state-by-state -state phenomenon, and we are here to serve our fans, and, and so we have, we have entered into it. It means an entirely new and very different way of collecting. You, got, you have to think about data completely differently. From, I mean, the biggest single thing, you got two, you got two problems, accuracy and latency. Right, uh, It has to be there as quickly as possible. It has to be as correct as possible because you are competing against people's eyes. 
Uh, arbitrage is a real thing, and if someone knows that the ball went in the hole before we tell the, the operator it did, there's a big opportunity to lose a lot of money. So we have to handle both of those things. Our SLA um, for, for what we deliver in terms of gaming is that we have to deliver delivery every piece of information off the golf course about every shot inside seven seconds, including public internet and response time. Uh, and so it has to get from wherever we are to London that quickly and back. Um, and that's, that's, that's just the standard that, we have, that we're up against. Yep. So when you look at this picture, you described tee box, there's a radar solution, there's a camera on the fairway, dependent upon par five, there could be two cameras, and then there's another radar on the actual putting green. When you look at kind of the size of these things, how, can you describe how big are they? Can you describe where they're put up? So, so basically, like you're, you're seeing a little, just a couple of pictures of the different, different pieces here. Um, one of the things that happens, so this is actually, one of the things that we've upgraded is we put a second gen radar unit on here. This is, for the simplest way to describe it, this is a missile tracking radar unit. So it's gone from a consumer grade unit to something that is capable of much more. And you'll notice this, this is, we're mixing a little bit uh, from, from what's coming or what, what now is on the golf course. We doubled the amount of radar that's on the golf course. Uh, so we can paint a picture both from the tee and then from the, from the green inbound. And you can get a feel for that. Um, it's interesting, physics is fun. Uh, a consumer grade unit that you may have seen, you'll see this when a lot of our players are warming up on the range, these bright orange units that are behind them. They're about this big, it's a square flat surface like this. This is the, literally the square of that. So go you know, that much bigger than it is. And they also include cameras for their use for calibrating the device. Uh, so in, and they, um, <laughs> they're heavy. <laughs> they weigh about 30, 40 pounds. Uh, and I, I asked them if they could make them, I, I, why it was so heavy, and they said because it's so accurate, so I asked them to make them twice as heavy, and they didn't think I was funny. Um, <laughs> but that's, that's basically what it's come to and what we put on the golf course now. So just for perspective, um, our friend Greg, who worked on this project, <laughs> is standing in front of one of the radar solutions, but it's, it's actually small. It's not that big. It's just mm -hmm. the way the camera angle, I took the camera <laughs> angle. <laughs> but it actually is, I mean, it's heavy, but it's, it's not that big. It's like a... It's literally about this yeah. big. No able to track a ball on launch angle all the way to road drop. Well, so, so actually, let me, let me, I'll go into that a little bit more. They, these, they're fairly impressive units. The reason that, uh, that we use them and the, what we like about them is um, they have the ability from the second, so take the one behind the tee box. From the second that the ball is hit within a second to a second and a half, we can measure pretty much every, characteristics of the, every characteristic of the ball. Um, and that includes everything down to the, uh, the, the axis of rotation, so what axis the ball is spinning at and, the, and its spin rate, which then allows us to do some fun math and figure out where the ball is going to go before it actually gets there. Um, if you think about it, the inbound is even more impressive. Uh, so you've got a, a radar unit that is sitting behind a, t uh, a green and it's designed to pick a ball, something out of the air, the size of a golf ball, right? Um, identify where it came from, who it belonged to, and where it's going to come with all those same characteristics. So it is a fairly complex problem, but what that allows us to do is then use that information while the ball is still in the air and do a lot of, and, and present that in a way that makes it more interesting what's happening. It gives context to what's happening, but also make predictions about what is likely to happen. So Ken, you talked about what's the data coming off the ball. You talked about media using it to track it. You talked about betting. There's another thing you mentioned, scoring. So when it comes to scoring, again, when Ken talked about this has to be in orchestration, every time a player is walking up on the green, you have to actually match the name of this is the person hitting the ball, this is where their ball is, is their shot. How are you doing that with AI and cameras? Because this is the middle part of that section. So we just talked about the tee box, mm -hmm. now you've gone to the fairway part of it with cameras. Right. So. Now, again, historically, this isn't the newer things, but what we have done in the past, and I'll come to the new stuff here in a minute, yeah. uh, but what we've done in the past is that we put three cameras around a green, and what that allowed us to do is, um, so again, if, radar is very good at tracking objects in the air, uh, not very good at tracking them on the ground. So once you get to a green, that's where the ball is rolling, right, just a different facet of the game, we, we needed a different solution to be able to figure out where the ball was going. We, again, this is about seven years ago, started using ML to build algorithms to track the ball as it moved across the ground and then give us ball in motion data. So one of the things that's interesting about this is that when Shotlink came into existence, we, for the first time, were able to put coordinates with shots. Okay, so, for example, um, you know, a player hits a ball, 
uh, and then it goes to a certain spot and someone shoots it with a laser and we now have an XYZ coordinate for the first time. Mm. That's what we have built this off of for the, a very long time. That has allowed us to create an entirely new set of statistics around golf and what it means, but that is also just how the ball, where the ball started and finished, not necessarily anything about how it got there. Um, once we started putting cameras on the greens, we started playing with being able to look at how that ball moved around the green and see the, the characteristics of the ball in motion, um, which was an entirely new set of information. And we've been working with this for a while now, trying to, to get it accurate and consistent enough that we could report on it, because it is a very challenging problem to, to track the ball that way uh, and figure out which object actually is the ball when you're looking at a green. So when you actually have these cameras, it's doing a lot of things. It's separating the background and anything moving from the ball it's having to actually understand which player and where the ball is, and more importantly, is the ball in a sand trap, is it on the fairway, or is it in the rough, because that's all going to sports betting. Right, well, and, well it goes to everybody. But, okay. but even then, one thing I left out in the process is, uh, a, a couple of weeks before we even show up to the golf tournament, we spend a great deal of time and effort mapping the golf course. Mm. Uh, so one of the things that we have to do is create the playing surface itself, and when I say that, I mean create it virtually. We, we obviously are not, this isn't the team that is going out and, and setting up the golf course. There are some people that are uh, agricultural wizards that do that. I don't understand their jobs, but it's cool. Um, but what we do is we will map that down to a very minute level. Uh, we use, at this point, we're using um, LIDAR, photogrammetry, survey tools, and things like that so that we can get a very precise look at what the, what the golf course looks like. Um, once we do that, that allows us to then say, okay, we put zones around everything that's there, and you map those zones, and that gives us the ability to then derive a lot from where the ball is and where it's going and, and how it got there. Got it. So now we talked about tee box with the radar. We talked about fairway with the camera, what it's doing. Now let's talk about how you've networked all this together. You, you said 15 to 20 miles, miles mm -hmm. of fiber. How many events does PGA put on in the United States? Uh, it'll be about 40, between 40 and 43. Okay, so 43 events where the PGA Tour rolls up before the tournament starts, lays, uh, maps the course itself, because this is what I learned during this whole process. The course is constantly changing. So this is what I learned when we were on this project together, that what happens one year, they could move an entire water feature somewhere else. Something could have happened and the course has completely changed. And that is the mapping that you have to do every year to each of the courses. Yeah, lakes show up in random places, which I know is not a sentence I ever thought I'd say. Uh, it just happens, oddly. Golf courses get set up, they change, trees fall, they go up, but even then, we have to map the edges of the green to a point that you can really figure it out because that is how statistics are measured. That is just a function of how it is mowed uh, in a given, like, it, and, and just think about over the course of a year how much that could move. Yeah, so speaking of mowing, when you look at fiber, what's the biggest enemy of a fiber cut? Yeah, so, you know, we have weed whackers, squirrels, lawnmowers. It's a lot of lawnmowers. One of the things that is a, a big problem for us is that uh, we have a, so we, we did not lay, start laying fiber in the process until after they put the rope line up. If you've ever been to a golf tournament, one thing you'll notice is that there's a whole bunch of stakes and ropes that are put out to sort of, it's, it's the lines that you can stand in and out of if you're, if you're a fan. We run around the greens, we bury it. Anything where it crosses uh, around a green or where someone crosses it, we would bury the fiber. Um, but along the rope line, we just we, we lay it on top. And the reason that we do it along the rope line is because they don't mow the rope line. Literally, that's what we wait for because it just happens a lot um, that, that, that we would lose that. So if you look on the left picture, that's the buried fiber that's coming out. The middle picture is the, the actual line where crowds can't go past. And you see what Ken just mentioned, the fiber's laying on top. And on the right is just in between holes, yep. laid right onto the, the concrete, basically. Yeah, it'll go, we'll, we will move across. If, if we find it, we will go through the woods on top, things along those lines, if we have a fairly long run to go. And when you look at all the requirements you just talked about, and we'll get more into kind of the technical requirements, fiber at this point, when you designed this seven to 10 years ago, was the best way to connect, be resilient, be making sure that you actually have the latency and the performance, right? Yeah, I mean, we, we live in, we, we have a lot of redundancy built in, but fiber, I mean, I know that wireless is super sexy, but fiber's pretty strong, you know? It works. Uh, you plug it in and it goes, and it's really fast. Uh, so it was, it was the best solution that we had to do what we needed to accomplish. Yep. 
And when you look at kind of this solution on fiber, you've had to design this where it's always changing, where on the first day, good weather, the second day you've had situations where it's bad weather and <laughs> things go down. So you're, you're changing on the fly? Yeah, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll give you, I'm, I'm, they're, they're, I gotta, they're always fun war stories, but this is uh, one of those operations where it's, it's definitely in the field when we play outside. So I'd, one of my favorite stories is about, it's about the team as much as it's about the tech. Um, and we have a, had a situation where we were playing, I wanna say it was in Greensboro, I think, it was two, three years ago, and on a Friday afternoon, uh, there was a flood. The, the rain came, came hard, they chased everybody off the golf course, they closed it, waited for, you know, play stop, and it was bad enough that even though we have I mean, these cases have, you know, moisture, temperature sensors, all the right mm -hmm. things. They're hardened to, you know, reasonable levels. And it doesn't matter. Outside is outside and stuff's going to break. And we lost about 10 of those cases. And overnight, the team stayed there, rebuilt them. We played golf on Saturday. and It was fine, which, which is fine. That's great, right? Saturday morning or Saturday afternoon, the lightning storm comes. And uh, they closed the golf course and they ran the people off. And, you know, because that's dangerous. And we lost. And we had 15, of those four, 15 more of those cases get burned literally to a crisp by lightning. And overnight, we rebuilt those cases, put them back out. And on Sunday morning, we played golf. So it's just, and it, it constantly, it evolves in a number of ways uh, over the course of a year, a week, and even just the course of play. I mean, it's really you used the word when we first met tactical. It is literally a tactical network, it moves every single week. It's changing every single day by the minute based on the weather or the lawnmower, and you have to be able to respond and react to it at yep. all times. The, the first time I went into one of the operations trucks, it looked like an operating table. There was equipment everywhere, and people had screwdrivers everywhere, and they were fixing everything. And you were actually testing some of the new tech we'll talk about later today. Yep, that's correct. So now you described that once the on-course stuff is happening between the actual tee box to the fairway to the putting green and how it all works, there's an ops center. And you had all cool, you know, <laughs> nicknames for all these people. But what, what's happening here? So what's going on is, is um, the way that we, so you got to keep in mind that no, keep, we're playing outside under imperfect conditions. No system of measurement is going to be perfect. No matter what you do, it will be imperfect. So and, and we, for a very long time, were much more concerned with speed than accuracy. And that's because when you're dealing with, in a pre-gambling world with an entertainment product, um, we want to make sure that fans had the score as quickly as possible. And if it took us a second to correct it, that was okay. So we would, we did, normally you, you measure, right? Uh, you, you measure it, you check it, and then you distribute it, right? Um, we would <laughs> measure, distribute, and then verify. And that was how we did it. What that meant was every time we, we built a massive pile of business rules, that said that if something looked like an anomaly, a producer, a scoring producer, so this isn't a TV producer, but they sit in a very similar environment where they have all these ability to look at things that are going on and correct them in real time. So I'll give you an example. Uh, let's say that someone's standing, we have, we have a, a, oh, I forgot this part. We, we used to score this with volunteers, so we'd have to train 300 new people to operate this on a weekly basis. Uh, there was a set staff, but also a set of volunteers who were working on it, which can make Thursday mornings interesting because they do it once a year. They don't practice all that much. Um, Has anybody been a volunteer at a PGA Tour event? Yes! <laughs> there um, we go. So, radar or tablet? <laughs> green, green side and Very cool. So, so for, as, as an example, we'll have a, 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 a volunteer that is standing there with a, with a tablet in the fairway that's, that's giving us a preliminary estimation on where the ball is going to go. This is how we used to estimate where the ball went. Um, and they literally they, they stab an estimated point so we get the right zone in a tablet. Um, and then what happens is right after that, another person will shoot that with a laser and get a more precise coordinate, okay? One of the things that could happen is that you end up with a zone that comes up and it says, the, they estimated that this was in the, in the right rough and it shows up in the fairway, cool. That immediately is surfaced on a producer's screen. They will pull up the information that's available and they either can see it, they can talk on the radio, or they can figure it another way that, that they can know what, what actually happened and correct it. Most of our errors are corrected inside of seconds. Um, some take a little longer depending on, on what happens with that. And that's, that's how we used to deal with, with errors like that. So there was an entire group of people that sat in a truck on the golf course and it looked, it, it was their traffic control. That was how we deal with it. Um, they handled everything from obviously scoring, scoring tech, scoring changes, scoring problems, volunteer management, motivational speaking, to any time that there was a, uh, like if there was a, um, you know, a problem and, and, saw, and a player needed a ruling. So they get a call from a volunteer, I need a ruling on six fairway right, and they would get somebody over there to EMS problems. It was just, just the operations center for a lot of that where things came in because we were in all those places. And you had talked about these DMARC boxes and you talked about kind of where they sat. That's where you had power, that's where you had the fiber, you had 
the actual mass for the cameras. So this is a picture of one of the DMARC boxes, the black box at the bottom. Can you describe what is the white panel right there? Yeah, so that white panel is actually a test. Um, that white panel, we, we started playing with the technology to look at we had other ways to power the system. Um, and that's one of the earlier so solar panels that we tested as part of the program. Yep. And power is super important because you have to, when you talked about redundancy and resiliency, you're doing the network being redundant, coming out of both sides. If someone, I asked Ken, why do you do that? If somebody mows one side of it, you've got the other side to go past. Yep. Power, you've got redundancy, you've got generators plus. Right, so, so think of it this way. Everything on the golf course has a battery in it. Um, and so let me actually back up on that for a second. Uh, I'm going to speak in very gross terms here for a second, but there is big power and little power in the, what we do on the golf course. Big power is things like video boards and trucks, and these are the giant generators that make a lot of noise and have a big transfer switch and, because it's required, right? And there's little power, and this is what we put around those kind of masts where you've got a camera or a switch or a, a radar unit or something along those lines. It's solid state. It doesn't take a lot of power, but if it goes down, it's very, very bad, right? Um, every one of those devices, generally speaking, has a, no, not generally, they have a battery in them because we make them have a battery in them. Um, and what happens is that that gives us a buffer of 45 minutes to two hours. We never assume more than that. Um, depending on, you, you gotta keep in mind, we get asked this question a lot. Why don't you just put batteries in everything? If I did that, I would dedicate two people to doing nothing but changing batteries all day, every day. This is because they die at weird times. They are all kinds of temperature conditions. They have all kinds of different lives. It is just an imperfect solution. So what we did was we said, let's use the battery as a redundancy. And then we put, and you can't see it here because we're fairly good at covering things up, but there is a generator that you more or less can't hear that sits in there. And then a propane solution where we would drop a propane canister next to it. It's all covered up. That is constantly trickle charging the entire golf course. So if we lose a generator at some location, what that means is that somebody's got 45 minutes to put their track shoes on and get to that place and fix it. And that's how we would operate. Um, and the way that we handle the propane, the reason for propane, everybody asks this question. Number one, it's not great. We try to avoid carrying flammable liquids across America's pristine golf courses as much as we can. They <laughs> really don't like it when we spill. Um, and, and the other reason is because it's containerized, right? So just as like anything else, it's easier when it's containerized. So we call up the, uh, for any of those who know what this is, if you, your, your Ace Hardware store that has the giant cage of blue rhino, you know, uh, you know, kind of big propane canisters at it, we would call them beginning of the week, they'd drop off three cages and we're set and we'd change those out roughly once a day and it just kept us cooking. But it gives us that redundancy level so that we're always operating and it never goes down. So there is a fleet of golf carts when people, when I was there and the team was there, they're just driving propane tanks <laughs> during the tournament, avoiding people just re replacing all these things. Yeah, there's, I, it's, when, when I bring people out and we show them kind of the behind part, I refer to it as, take, and I can never remember which it is, they take the red pill or the blue one and it's, you start things, things, seeing things you can't unsee anymore yeah. that you start recognizing why is that there, what is that for, what is this piece for, all of the different infrastructure pieces that are there. We try to actually make them as invisible as we can, but that's one of those things that you start noticing is guys running around with golf carts that have propane tanks <laughs> staying in the back of them. Everywhere. Um, so here's a moment, are there, and we'll ask again at the end, but does anybody have questions about the inner workings? Because the next part we'll go through is a little bit of research around why this is so important when you think about the convergence of this technology, whether it's the network that Ken talked about, whether it's the power solution, whether it's the actual compute on the cloud and how you're actually transmitting all this. Um, any questions on kind of the as-is state of where we are? Yeah. Just interested in the, um, what data you're tracking, what you're responsible for, the AWS angle. Um, yes. And that kind of thing. No, so, so, um, so here's one thing, and you said you differentiate, you said not broadcast video. So here's a fun thing, we don't differentiate. Um, now, to be super clear, I am not responsible for broadcast cameras, okay? That is a different thing. But if you think about it, and we're gonna talk in a second and this will make more sense, but data is just, video is data, data is video, it doesn't matter. But so think about it as this, we are responsible for every piece of information about the entire golf course. And what you're gonna see here in a few minutes when we talk about it some more is that we're building a virtual representation of the entire course. So start with that map. That is a whole lot of ones and zeros that are representing down to the tree, leaf, branch, and rock what's happening on that golf course or, or high, its its state. 
Then layer on top of that, every person that is moving on that golf course, every ball that is moving on that golf course, and precise coordinates for all the places that they moved. Take all that information and start turning it into art, more or less. And so anything that becomes, like as you build a trace, as you build data around a trace, any of that is the data that's happening. So the most basic level of data is, frankly, just the score. We have to take a coordinate and translate it into a number that is a score for a given hole for a given player, but then start going down deeper and deeper and deeper, and you can get, you can go, it's a rabbit hole. You can go pretty far in, in figuring out what that means. But that is all the data that we're responsible for. Yes? Uh, can I just hear more about the laser? Uh, <laughs> I, uh, I'm wondering about the laser, because uh, in my experience, it's tough to get precise location, especially with something as small as a ball, so maybe just how do you make that accurate uh, in the old way, I guess, uh, before you get into the new stuff? Yeah, so we, it's a great question, actually. Um, we've used lasers for a long time. Um, I mean, if you've played golf at all, a laser rangefinder is a fairly standard piece of equipment. Like anything in life, uh, you can find uh, cheap ones and expensive ones, and normally quality follows, right? So think about it that way. We actually, we test them, and we audit them like crazy. Uh, so we would go through and... Also, there is a training element here that goes in where we do a whole lot of training. We have a whole set of video training that's online and then in-person training with all the people that operate those on a regular basis. When we started doing ShotLink, before we put the camera system on the greens, which is pretty accurate, we actually used two different types of lasers. We would put a standard rangefinder in the fairway because there you've got a little bit more room for error um, and you can find the ball, it's okay. Um, you also have a walking score that is literally next to the ball so that you can confirm things and do things along those lines. Um, and then around the greens, we used a surveying geometer. And, and that took an interesting amount of training. And trying to do that fast is really hard. So it just came down to use case, right? How, you know, you can, you can trade time and money for accuracy at different points. And we would just make that decision based on what was needed. Oh, get one more here. Hi, I'm, I'm curious. You mentioned. Uh, composite fiber being buried around the greens uh, when it's sort of in the field of play. How do you do that in a way that doesn't disrupt the sort of pristine condition of the course? Yeah, um, we have hard conversations. Um, <laughs> so the, the very short version is that we come along and we spade it, and so you don't dig it up. You basically spade, lay, and then come down. We are not, we are not burying something for permanence. You've got to keep that in mind. This isn't a two-foot trench. Um, we're just, we are getting it out of the way and trying to leave it the way we found it. Over time, that is something that I, I know this is going to sound pedantic, but we get very good at it with time because you just you practice and you figure out how to do it. And, and we've gotten to have a relationship with superintendents where they understand it. The even more big picture answer to your question is um, nobody wants to give up the toys, and so they're willing to make a sacrifice to get what they want. Right? Uh, everybody wants to be able to follow the golf better than they have. And so they, they go, OK, if this is what it takes, my alternative is to leave it hanging, put it underground, or not have it. And so you, know, you, you figure out the best way to do that, and then you practice. I mean, literally, that's what it comes down to, is get better at doing that so that it looks the way we want it to look. Mm -hmm. Does Augusta let you do the same, same setup? Oh, does it, uh, the question is, does Augusta oh. let you do the same setup? <laughs> Yeah, so Augusta, for those that don't know, Augusta National, that is where the Masters is played. Um, it's a lovely golf club in Georgia. Um, they, that is, so fun fact about professional golf, um, we actually do not score that golf tournament. They do it themselves. It is one of the few that we don't score. And it is one of the few golf tournaments that stays no matter what at the same place all the time. And they have chosen to invest heavily in putting, they, there is a lot, uh, the, the, amount of, uh, the amount of cable underneath of that property is amazing. Uh, so they, they, they find ways to push things, to bury them, and to, and to do a lot of that. When you work in the same stadium, so this is, again, th that, that is one of the few exceptions where I envy people that have lines on the ground that are constant, right? So if you go to a tennis court, you know where the lines are, and there is a regulation size. Um, Augusta, they actually have a little advantage. They're closer to that than, than we are the rest of the time because they own that property. They live on that property. They make it do what they want, and they bend it to their will. So it's a slightly different model and very good at what they do. Back in the corner. Oh, yes. Yeah, I'll project. You go ahead. What's the question? Uh, two parts. Uh, so is there any tracking on or inside the pool at all? Um, and the second part is the data. How do you feed it back to the players? So presumably the players are really interested in the data and how it, how it performs. Uh-huh. So, so, so just question is, 
is there any tracking inside the ball, different way to solve the mousetrap? And number two, do the players get the data or how did they actually use the data? Yeah, so I get asked a question about the ball a lot. It's a great question. Uh, Top Golf, their earlier technology was really well, this was how they built their, the Top Golf, um, you know, the, the range piece that they do. Um, they've since moved past it and I'll explain why in a second. It's, the challenge you have is that they're really, especially on a golf course when we play outside, meaning not at a range, um, you have two options, okay? So you've got GPS, which means that you've got to have, first off, it's not as accurate as you think it is. It's harder to localize than you think it is, and we can go into depth about that. And secondly, that means you've got to have a power source that is too big for the ball. A, a golf ball, by the way, is, you may not realize it, but a ridiculously fine-tuned piece of equipment. Like, it is something that is very, has very high tolerances. Um, and the people that make them expect perfection. I'm not joking. If you go to a Titleist factory, it is something worth seeing. So th there's that piece. That rules that out. The second option largely is RFID, right? So you put an RFID chip in the ball, lower power, it's easy to do. At that point though, the problem is I'm gonna have to put a sensor network underneath the entire golf course to make it worthwhile. So you sort of run into a problem of measurement versus projection, you know, like broadcasting it. And we haven't seen a good solve for that. I'm not saying it won't happen in the future, um, but between manufacturing it, measuring it, just figuring all that piece out, it's, it's not something we've found it, it's, it is a better solution to look at other ways of measuring and leave, the, and leave that piece alone. Um, in the future, who knows? We rule nothing out, but that's where we're at today. Your second question, how do we get to the players? So the first thing is the players get nothing during live play. I, I don't think you were, in, uh, you were implying that, but I just want to be very clear about that. They, they don't get to have that data because it could influence what they, how they play and the choices they make. They don't get to do that. Um, it's against the rules. So that is something that we work very closely with the rules staff and all of our, our team that has that in mind to make sure that we are well within those parameters. After that though, you're absolutely right. More and more data, more and more players, more and more interest. Some of them are, more and more of them are actually hiring outside help, analysts, people that think about data this way. Um, and we provide all of our players. So the PGA Tour is actually a membership organization. Uh, since they are members, we provide this data to them in uh, pretty much whatever form they ask for and uh, help them. We, we give everybody the same set of information and we give it to them raw and then they can fold, spindle, and mutilate it at their will. And if you think about on the that usage of data side, it's also practice rounds yes. too. Players can get access to the data during the practice rounds. It's just during the field of play, that is not. You got it. And right. we'll, yeah, I'll let you do this one and then we'll come back to that because we'll talk more <laughs> about practice rounds and some other stuff. There's some goodies. Yeah, yeah. So I, I think as you hear some of the questions, it's so interesting because it's everybody wants the ability, as you said, the toys, right? The ability to read the data, see the data, it enriches the game. It, absolutely creates better engagement. So when you look at kind of left-hand side, so one thing Accenture did was we surveyed a thousand different industries and of those CEOs that we talked to, we just wanted to figure out what's the investment that's been put into the infrastructure you talked about, the convergence of the technology versus the expectation of the network versus the digital transformation that you're getting out of it. So on the left-hand side, you're seeing some of the results of this that that really steep hockey stick is really what the impact of digitalization in all these industries are. So incredible at 162X, basically saying that this is what everybody wants. The middle line at 40 above is basically how much the network capacity has had to actually keep up with everything that Ken just talked about. And that line at the very bottom that almost looks flat at 2X is actually the investments that have been made in the infrastructure like the network on this. So one, you can look at the very positive side of things and say, what little investment <laughs> has been able to create such a massive you know, explosion of digitalization? And the other side is, you know, we can't really keep up with what is being asked from media, from broadcast, from betting, from the actual fans if we don't change this. And, and that's what we'll talk about the second half of this meeting, is what are the things that PGA Tour is doing to change that? Now what's interesting is, is of that 2x spend, the left-hand side, you see that purple uh, and gray bar, 46% of that spend is going towards the legacy network. The legacy network that has tech debt, that has security holes, that has issues that can't keep up, just to keep that running, to keep everything going on at that PGA Tour event, almost half the budget is being spent on just keeping it running. So there's not a whole lot left on innovation, on modernizing, on actually creating a more efficient solution. So just a little bit more before we get into kind of what the future holds. What's also interesting is that 
when we actually looked at the enterprise executives, 50% already said that there's a ton of network issues that are impacting this. And you heard Ken talk about that they've manually built redundancy by having fiber coming out of the DMARCs in two directions, but overall there's security breach issues. Not, not a PGA tour, just simply saying that of the industries that we talked about, right, security breaches, there's high cost of deployment. I mean, imagine what Ken just said. It's five days before every tournament, you have to manually go and spade some of the fiber. You have to actually lay all the actual network and the DMARCs. Um, inconsistent network availability. One of the things we talked about in this was that it's hard to get Wi-Fi on the course for the fans because you're using the network capacity for all the actual shot link solutions. Well, it's, it's, it's network capacity, but also it is a time and space problem. Yeah. So golf tournaments are, are, this is another fun anomaly of golf tournaments. You have two ways to watch a golf tournament. You can either sit in one place and watch everybody go by, or you can follow a group around and see where they go. Either way, that means that the, the fans aren't sitting in one spot. It, again, I envy stadiums. I don't envy their concrete, but I do envy all the other pieces that you know where the people are, you know where they're going to be. You can build for that. You can create capacity. We have a bubble, like there's a mass that moves. And so where you need Wi-Fi right now is really hard to get set up. And even then when you do, you never know how much capacity is really going to be required at that particular spot at that particular moment. Yeah, the fact that the crowd moves, you could all of a sudden see a big group following a very popular player and all of a sudden your capacity is taken out. Yep. Yeah, I mean, that's so, it's, it requires, again, a tactical, flexible, resilient network and the actual digital solutions on top of it. So. And, and at the end of this, we'll, we'll share a QR code of all this research. If you're really into it, you can read the 90 pages uh, of the results at the end of this. Um, but then, so what's the answer, right? How, how do you come out of this situation where the network is an inhibitor at this point, the investments in the infrastructure is lacking, and we're not getting the actual output that we require? Well, then the discussion became, Ken, how are you creating a digital core? And that digital core is how do you look at the network connectivity? How do you deal with cloud and edge? Because the edge of the course is where you have to pull all of the data off of very quickly. You said six to seven seconds round trip from the course to AWS and back. No, 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 not to AWS. That oh, has to that's go right. To AWS, that has to, to London. To London, that's then it right. has to come back and be acknowledged. Right, six seconds mm -hmm. from course to AWS to London, yeah. come back and go. It's 500 milliseconds off the golf course. That's right. basically what the, op that's the objective. Right, so 500 off the golf course six to seven round trip all the way back. We like to leave some buffer in there if we can. Because <laughs> <laughs> there's an SLA associated. There is an sure. SLA, yeah. Yeah, so there's a penalty payment associated if, if that fails. Right. Yeah, I mean, so this becomes a very mission critical situation because there's a payment tied to it. Right. Um, and then what are you gonna do with kind of data and AI and all those great questions around, you know, how do you look at the data? How do you separate the data? Is video just another piece of data and how do you actually use this in different places? And then ultimately, how do you wrap cloud and security around that? So being able to reinvent your digital core has been almost the only way you've been able to keep up with this. Yeah, so th that's, I mean, not to, not to jump too far ahead, but basically what happened was that about 18 months ago, we made the decision to basically burn that all to the ground and start over uh, and build it from scratch and say that we had squeezed every piece of efficiency we possibly could out of the legacy infrastructure and we had to start over. And if you think about it, uh, what we do has more or less four layers to it, right? There's a bottom layer of just logistics. You cannot do this unless you think about it as a logistics, not just a tech problem. You've got to get this stuff out and get it back every single week. So the circus has to go up and it has to come down. And then the second layer is the software itself, right? So that living in a server in a truck, servers don't like trucks. I don't know if you guys know that, but it's bad, okay? And, and so we had to think about that. Uh, and the third layer is network, literally network. And we think of network as three things. You've got middle of the golf course to the edge, edge to the cloud, and then cloud to distribution from there, right? And then the fourth is the one that everybody actually thinks is what the job is, which is those cool, fancy sensors that we put all over the golf course where you get into cameras and things like that. We had to rethink every single one of those layers. And then the network was a big one. And is it, 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 well, we can talk more about, about what yeah. we ended up doing. And the convergence of all of that so that you can actually send it to broadcast, do the sports betting, exactly. share with the fan experience. So one way is certainly, I can use the word burn it down to the ground. Uh, another way you could look at it. Um, is you know, kind of stabilize the current environment. How do you actually leverage and modernize the current tech in pieces and waves, which you actually are doing, mm -hmm. right? So actually, when you say burn it down, I would say from a design perspective, yes. but from a deployment perspective, you're trialing things of the new solution right now before the new tour starts in January. 
Uh, yeah, um, there is an old and fun meme, you know, the I don't often test, but when I do, I test in production. That was our life this year. <laughs> I, and I, I wish, I actually am incredibly proud of the team that did it because we literally did do that. Every single week, we built the whole new infrastructure. It was built in parallel while we continued to operate, meeting the SLAs we had to with a legacy system. Once we did that, we started dropping things. So we'd put, we would put, you know, we, we, you saw the solar test that was going out there. That's the power system. We did a new network system. Some pieces of that went out. We tested that at various locations. The scoring system itself, we put new sensors out that were uh, the radar and, and new different cameras that we can talk about. We put that down starting at, you know, we did one hole, then we did four holes. We stayed at four holes for a long time, then we did nine. So little by little, we were pushing those things into production. And the advantage, so all the things we've talked about are these challenges, right? It's everywhere, it's big, it's a lot of things, it's unique, it's outside, all these problems, okay? The advantage that we have is that we do this every single week. So you have a lot of reps to figure stuff out and you can see where things are gonna break. And so, yeah, we, we made the decision that it was all going to be brand new. Yeah. And we did, made the decision we were going to do it very quickly, but what we also did was say, we're gonna stage this and use this strength to test ongoing and recursively over time. And then once you actually test recursively, then you just step on the gas pedal, 3.3, fully accelerate, because your season is not changing. Your tour is January in Hawaii, and that's when you go live. Yeah, it's gonna be fine. <laughs> I'm very confident, it's gonna be fine. Um, so, you know, one data point that we found out of this research that was really interesting is that 87%, just so you heard Ken talk about the AI that, he's, that the PGA Tour has built, all those pieces that have happened, and what's super interesting is that of those thousand enterprise executives that we researched, 87% have already said that the growing demand of data and AI systems has already outstripped their current legacy networks. Yeah. Like that's a pretty staggering piece. I mean, let's give you guys an example. I'll, give you, I'll throw a number at you really quickly. In the last, over the, over the last two to three years, I could I'd have to pick the actual date, but we've, we've gone from, um, we have multiplied by 10 the amount of data that we're pulling off the golf course. Um, and so that just, that's, a, that's a lot of pipe that's got to get built big fast. So we're now going to shift to what is new. What, what can everybody expect in this room, January in Hawaii, it's going to go fine, no issues. <laughs> but maybe first talk about your partnership with AWS. What are you doing with AWS? We talked about it going to AWS Cloud and then going to Betty, but what's that relationship like? They're your innovation partner. Yeah, so actually, let me, let me even back up from there for a second, because it's, it's hard for me to talk about AWS as a separate thing, because it's folded into everything we do. So, so just take a step back, and we, what we said we wanted to do, given the opportunity, we wanted to rethink how we do everything we do. In other words, question literally everything and assume it. So the first thing we did is we said, look, we're not gonna make the SLA any harder because it's pretty hard, right? That's a challenging one, so we left that where it is. But we wanted to go from ball, so to increase the depth and breadth of the data we collect. Right now, as I mentioned, we're collecting an XYZ coordinate, or we were collecting XYZ coordinate for start and finish position. What we decided to do was that we wanted to move to a system where we could get ball in motion from every single, every, from every shot, okay? So that means that, like just, Paint a picture for yourself for a second. When you have XYZ data, that's super cool, and you can do interesting, and you can build cool stats off it, and it's amazing, but when you get to where you're collecting and storing a polynomial for every shot to describe its path and how it moved, now we have literally moved from algebra to calculus in terms of how we can create information and think about statistics. I have no idea what we're gonna do with that yet, but it's gonna be freaking cool, okay? So that's, that's coming, that's, that's option two. Option three, the next thing we wanna do is we wanna do it faster, right? So how can we re reorient our operations so that we do it more quickly, we can put out more? This is literally built around growing capacity. More people want us to put this in more places all the time. It's not just about shrinking costs, it's about doing it in more places. If we can cut that time down, we can deploy this to more areas. The other piece we wanted to do is reduce the footprint on site. So how can I do that, get down from five trucks to three, or you know, at worst case, four, so that we can put things in fewer boxes and make it smaller. Every one of these things is, oh, and then also, we need to be able to move more globally. We're getting more and more demand in more and more places to do this. So those are what we started with. When we did that, it was cool because it forced us to have some constraints. We realized if we're gonna do that, we can't do what we've done before. This isn't an incremental upgrade. And that was where we started out and said, well, first off, we need to rethink how we do production entirely. So instead of having producers sitting in trucks, super cool look at, right? Air traffic control's neat and you can see the guys doing stuff and we've got these nifty one-way mirrors. It's very cool, it's very fun. But at the same time, that is not scalable and doesn't work very well if we're trying to go to a lot of places and do it more quickly and shrink the footprint. So we immediately moved to where we said, we're going to rebuild all of the 
the software layer, so take the ops layer out for a second, take the, the, the infrastructure out, that software layer that's defining everything that comes in and collecting all the data and defining it and putting it in buckets that make sense, that is going to be built completely new and cloud native. That gives us immediate flexibility. We can make it as big or as small as we want. They'd love to tell me that compute and, uh, and storage are infinite. You know, it's just it's completely scalable. So we do that, and we, and we have taken advantage of that. What that means is that we have moved all of our production to be in our headquarters in Ponte Vedra Beach, Florida. There are no more people sitting in trucks doing production. We, put, we now do radio over IP, so it doesn't matter where you're sitting. Time and space are a construct in this world, right? So it doesn't matter where you're sitting. You can be talking on, on the radio as if you're local wherever the golf tournament's happening, but you're sitting in Ponte Vedra Beach. What that means is that we can think totally differently. Now that your, your workday is not, if you're a producer, your workday isn't 5 a.m. until after the guys are done, an hour after they're done playing golf, which is a long day, right? No, no, if the, the case comes out that you can work shifts, you can have a life, which is something people like to do. You can also, if we need to add capacity, if something goes weird, if we have a weird format, we can put more people on it or they cannot. All these things make it possible. Disaster recovery, by the way, becomes a completely different thing. I joke about this, but there's a lot of truth in it. We have guys set up right now where they have dual 42 inch monitors that are set vertically so you can see as much of the golf course as possible because there's sensors I'm gonna talk about in a second. They're sitting there, but if they had to, literally find a Starbucks, open your laptop, and you can score the golf, okay? We can get it done that way if we have to. Um, not optimal, but it works. That's what, the, the cloud is, is not, like we didn't think of this as lift and shift. There was nothing to lift and shift. We were not doing it that way. We said, here is a set of tools we can use. How can we build these things together and start thinking about things as processes and microservices and put this stuff into different places where it makes sense for us to operate that way? How can we take advantage of those and build bigger, faster, longer? So we did all of that piece and that built AW, um, um, with AWS. Then the network piece we'll talk about in a second. The sensor piece, we went completely different and said, instead of, we, first off, oh, by the way, we want to take as many humans out of the loop as possible. I forgot that was one of the objectives. So stop training volunteers quite so much. We, we love them. <laughs> they still will have a role. I'm not pretending that. But can we do something so that it becomes easier? Like it's just easier to find the ball. What that meant was moving to a different sensor set. What that meant was going from 54 cameras around, so three around each green, to where we had more than 120 that we deploy on the golf course. And going from 20 frame black and white to 4K, uh, full, you know, so, and basically full color. Um, that gives us a whole lot of opportunity to collect data. And then start building with AI and ML tools that are built because we use everything that is coming into us. With, again, compute is available for us in a cloud world. Start building with that and you can take AI and measure Take a 2D sensor, put it in a 3D plane, and start projecting everything that's happening in real time across that cool 3D map that we built and show you anything you want to see from any angle at any time for any shot. Um, and then when you add to that the radar and you start layering these two things together, we can get to a point where video is simply a display mechanism. It is not anymore the only, it's not just a, a, a way to like measure or do things like that. One of my favorite things I saw was we were testing and we pulled, we have the radar and the cameras talking to each other. Every sensor is both a source and a destination for information, right? So a player hits a ball, radar picks up that shot, it broadcasts, we can put, put a trace on it. At the same time, the camera picks up the ball. That scoring camera, we watched as that ball, the trace went outside the frame. So the ball no longer has to be seen to be measured and shown anywhere you want to put it. Now you're talking about doing things like taking that shot and spinning it in multiple dimensions. Can you follow it from the side and still see what's doing and put data around it? Now you're starting to tell stories with that. So that's what that gives us. And that's, by the way, that is the scalability. That is the opportunity that we had with AWS. But then the ability to converge all of that to tell a story is really, really hard, right? You have to be able to do what's the story you want to tell, what's the actual layers of the technology that you need, how do you find the right partners for each one, yep. and then how do you put it all together, and then, oh, by the way, it's changing day to day. Mm -hmm. It's pretty cool. Pretty easy. Mm -hmm. no, no, no problem there. Um, when it comes to, one thing you mentioned was the network part of it, right? So that was part of the stack that we had talked about and we had worked on together. So Accenture and PGA Tour worked on kind of the network layer of it. And you asked me and the team to come in and evaluate the different ways to not have to use all of the fiber because your shot link two was now, you, as you said, doubling the amount of radar, increasing the amount of cameras. So that's just more fiber, mm -hmm. right? And that then, as, as the gentleman asked before, that's more digging. That's more transport costs. That is more operational challenges. So one thing that I was super impressed with was you actually had a lot of hypothesis 
on what you wanted to look at. Maybe opinions, but <laughs> hypothesis. What, what were the things that you wanted us to look at before we ultimately kind of decided and designed the, the January solution? So here's the, the, this is a very practical problem. When we said we were gonna put cameras around the entire golf course, that meant that, this is gonna sound funny, but we had to go to the other side of the fairway, okay? Because at that point, we're no longer just putting cameras around the green, you're not putting one on each side of the fairway on a par five, and sometimes more than that, plus one behind the green. Before that, we would run down one side of the fairway and around the green, and that was it. We did not want to run fiber around every hole as well as around six three hole loops, right? That's just more and more, to your point. So we started looking at options. Obviously, you know, wireless is a thing. Power is still a thing. Um, and that's where we ended up with, um, so talking about the network first, we, we started out looking at what is a, we need high volume, low latency, and dedicated, like it has to be resilient. Um, and we started laying out all the different options that were there. So we obviously looked at, uh, we looked at private 5G, we looked at hybrid public private 5G, we looked at a lot of different elements in that, we looked at um, some other, like straight up, like fiber alone is an option, some private wireless stuff, and, and we also looked at some other solutions that would do it. And where we ended up, what we ended up doing was just looking at what was gonna give us, what's this, an operational um, optimization, something that is cost effective, but more, more than that, resilient, right? Uh, and something that, that would allow us to get and to have enough throughput to actually make it work. Uh, and so we built this fun matrix that, you know, was very matrixy um, about how that would work. And we tested these for over, for about a year. We tested all kind, well, more than that even, a bunch of different solutions, building every one of those options out and trying different things with them. Um, and then when we did, once we figured that out, we, we realized, look, we, we do know a lot about this. We work in this. We're reasonably intelligent people. We also know that we don't know everything. And so that was why we asked Accenture to come in and basically tell us, A, did we ask the right questions? B, did we look at all the right options? And what did we miss? Like, what did we just not know that we didn't know? And so that's, that's what we worked together on. Yep. And then how can we create a nominal design on one of the, the different selections? What's the business case around that math question you had asked? And then ultimately, who are the partners that can help you deliver this? And that was the fun journey um, that we were on.